Lesson 12.1 is sequences. I would pause the video and write down these notes. A sequence is a function whose domain is the set of positive integers, so 1, 2, 3, so on and so forth. Every once in a while we'll include 0, it kind of depends on the context, um, but no decimals, fractions, and no negative numbers. So, for example, if you look at just the function 1 over x for positive x's, this would be the function, you have everything in between. If we look at the sequence, f of n equals 1 over n, then it's only the specific points where n is an integer. Each value in the sequence is called a term. We usually write them in order, numbered order. Um, so this would be the first term, second term, so on and so forth. Uh, we use these curly brackets here to represent sequences or terms in a sequence. And then we also use this sequence notation. So instead of using function notation, we use this subscript notation. So a sub 1 would be equivalent to saying f of 1. a sub n would be equivalent to saying like f of n or f of x. So we use this subscript notation to represent uh, sequences. The general term or the nth term, also sometimes called the explicit formula, is the basically function equation for the sequence. So if we're representing this sequence here, then a of n equals 1 over n, that is the general term. This notation here, an exclamation point in math, means factorial. So n factorial means multiply every number integer from 1 up to that value together. So n factorial would be 1 times 2 times 3 all the way up times n. So for example, 5 factorial would be 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5, which is 120. Scientific and graphing calculators have factorial buttons. On a TI-84, you go to the math button and then go over to probability, PRB, and then the fourth one down is factorial. So writing out the first six terms of a sequence, if a general term or an explicit formula is given to you or any type of formula, then you just start plugging in starting with n equals 1 all the way up to how many ever terms you want. So for example, this first one, a sub n equals n minus 1 over n. If I want to find the first six terms, first I would just plug in 1. 1 minus 1 over 1 would be 0. Then I would plug in 2. 2 minus 1 over 2 would be 1 half. So on and so forth, all the way up to 6. Most of the time, you can probably pick up the pattern, so you may not need to actually plug it in every single time. In this case, the denominator is always just whatever n is, and the numerator is 1 less. So go ahead and pause the video and try b of n. Find the first six terms. So for this next one, I just plugged in 1 to start with, so you get negative 1 to the 1 plus 1 times 2 over 1, so you end up with a positive 2. Next one, you end up with a negative 1, then positive 2 thirds, negative 1 half, positive 2 fifths, negative 1 third. Whenever you see something like this in a sequence, it just means your sign's going to alternate every single one. It's going to go back and forth. So that has been finding the first six terms in a sequence. Your graphing calculator does do sequences. If you go into your mode, you can actually change your calculator into sequence mode. So most of your calculators would be in function mode, which is the fourth option down. And you go all the way over to SEQ, that's sequence mode. And then you can actually graph and look at tables and um, have your calculator actually do more sequence stuff. Given a sequence, you want to be able to write the general formula or the nth term or the explicit formula. So if you're looking at these four sequences here, we want to write out what the general formula is. So it's really looking at a pattern. Think of it as writing an equation or a function. It's the same idea where your inputs are 1, 2, 3, 4. So how can I write this first term as something with a 1, like my input being 1? How can I write the second term as my input being 2? So what's the pattern to it? So for example, this first one is pretty obvious. I have to have an e in it, obviously, and then if this first term is 1, it's a little bit hard to see, so then moving on to the second one, well, I'm raising, if this term is 2, I'm raising e to the second power, and I'm also dividing it by 2. And then does that pattern hold? I'm raising e to the third power and dividing it by 3. So then my sequence would be e to the n divided by n. So go ahead and pause the video and try to write a general term for the second one. So in this one, I noticed that the pattern was, it was always 2 times n minus 1, so 2n minus 1, and then I checked just to make sure, so for the first term, 2 times 1 minus 1 is 1, 2 times 2 minus 1 is 3, so on and so forth. So go ahead and pause the video and try numbers 3 and 4. 
For number three, I noticed that it's always one over three to a power, but it's offset. It's not one over three to the whatever n power it is. It's actually down by one. So that's why I made it one over three to the n minus one. So that makes this first one when I plug in one be one over three to the zero, which is one. The second one would give you one over three to the two minus one, which is one over three, so on and so forth. And then the last one, I noticed that the sign is alternating like we talked about on the previous slide. So I knew I had to have this negative one to a power, but I wanted it to alternate so that the when I plug in an odd number, it ends up being positive. So I had to have my exponent be even. So that's why I have n plus one. You could have also done n minus one, something like that, just to offset that negative. And then everything else was just one over n. So looking at the pattern and writing this as explicit formula so that when you type plug in n, you get the term that you want. Another type of formula we have for sequences are recursive formulas or recursive sequences, which means that the term or the current term is defined by one or more of the previous terms. Um, they have to give you at least the first term so that you know where to start. So for this first example here, they tell us that s sub 1 is equal to 1. So they're telling us the first term is 1, and then every term after that, s sub n, is equal to the term number n times s sub n minus 1. So that would be the previous term. So it's always the term number times the previous term. So this is a recursively defined sequence. So if I want to write out the first five terms, first they already give us the first term, and so then from there I can find the next four. So again, they give us the first term, so s sub 1 is just 1. So that s sub 2 is going to be n, which is 2, times s of 2 minus 1, or s of 1, so the previous term. So I'm going to multiply 2 times 1, and I get 2. So then s of 3 is going to be n, which is 3, times the previous term, s of 2, so 3 times 2 is 6. So then s of 4 is going to be 4 times the previous term, which was 6, so 24, and then s sub 5 is going to be 5 times the previous term, which was 24, so 120. So you're using previous terms to find the current term. A very common recursively defined sequence is called the Fibonacci sequence, which says the first and the second term are both 1, and then every term after that is equal to the previous two terms added together. u sub n is equal to u sub n minus 2, 2 previous, plus u sub n minus 1, 1 previous. So go ahead and find the first five terms of the Fibonacci sequence. So for the first two terms, they already gave us that for the Fibonacci sequence. u sub 1 and u sub 2 are both 1. So then u sub 3 would be the first term plus the second term, so 1 plus 1 is 2. u sub 4 would be the second term plus the third term, 1 plus 2 is 3. And then the fifth term would be the third term plus the fourth term, 2 plus 3 is 5, so on and so forth. So that is a recursively defined sequence. Summation notation is how we show the summing up of a sequence or a summing up of terms. Um, a series is a sequence that is being added up. So this summation notation, we use the capital letter sigma to represent summing up. Whenever in math you see a sigma, it means add everything up. So this is saying add everything up from the first term until the nth term of the sequence a sub k. So that means take the first term, a sub 1, plus the second term, plus the third term, add them all the way up until you get to a sub n. Ellipses in sequences specifically, math in general, means keep this pattern going, blah, 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 until you get to this point. So you'll see a lot of ellipses in sequences and series. So for this next summation, we're summing up from term 1 to term 4 of the sequence 1 over k. So pause the video and just write out the summation, just like this. So I just wrote out the first four terms of the sequence 1 over k, 1, 1 half, 1 third, 1 fourth, and added them up. And in this case, we're just writing out the expansion, so that's just all you're looking for. So again, whenever you see this notation, it means add up all the terms in this sequence from the whatever term they list down here first up to the term they list up here last. So now we want to go the other way. We have this sequence here, and we want to write it in summation notation. So you want to write this notation here. So go ahead and pause the video and try that. So I have my sigma. We always start at k equals 1 unless you know otherwise, but when you're writing the sigma, that's how we always write it. And I'm going up to the fifth term, so I'm going from k equals 1 to 5, and then find the nth term of the sequence, which is 1 over 2 to the k minus 1. Here's a list of properties of summations of sequences or series. Um, your calculator will also do summation of sequences as well, so that's something that you can look up. 
Um, but for example, if this first one, C is just a number, so like two, you're summing up the sequence that's just the number two for n terms, it'd be two plus two plus two n times, so therefore it'd be two times n. This one, this notation's the same, the equation editor just kind of messed it up a little bit, but if you're summing up a sequence that has a addition or subtraction in the middle, like you're adding two sequences together, you can actually just sum up each individual sequence and add those sums together. And then two just general ones that show up every once in a while, if you're summing up the sequence that's just n, just k, um, so it would be like 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, then it ends up being this, n times n plus 1 over 2, whatever your n value is, your n term. And then if it's the same thing but k squared, so like 1 plus 4 plus 9, so on and so forth, then it follows this pattern, n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6. One last property as well, if you're summing up a sequence that is like an integer or number times a sequence, um, you can actually pull that number out in front and sum up the sequence and then multiply it by the number. So for example, if you're summing up the sequence of like 5k, then you could just sum up the sequence k and then multiply that whole thing by 5. So use the properties on the previous slide to evaluate these two sums. So this first one, like that last property that I talked about, if you have 3k, you can actually pull that 3 out in front, sum up the sequence of just k, and then multiply it by 3. So I use the property for the sum of the sequence just k going up to n equals 4. So you end up with 4 times 4 plus 1 over 2, you get 10, and then I multiplied that by 3. So if you haven't already done so, go ahead and pause the video and try the second one. Again, I used the properties on the previous slide to split this up. So this is a sum or difference of sequences, so I can write them as a sum or difference of sums. So I thought of the sum from 1 to 4 of k squared minus, I pulled out the 7 like here, so minus 7 times the sum of 1 to 4 of k plus the sum of 1 to 4 of 3, and then I just use each of those individual properties. So the k squared property is n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6, so I just plugged in 4, minus 7 times the k property, n times n plus 1 over 2, and then plus the constant one, which was just n times the value of 3. So you end up with 30 minus 7 times 10 plus 12, which is negative 28. On your TI-84, your calculator will do summations. Um, you go to math, and then number 0 is summation. It'll actually show up, with the newer ones, it'll actually show up a summation. You just plug in each of the pieces. Older calculators, you have to do a little bit more work. They will do summations, though. One application of sequences is financial math, so I would pause the video and write down these notes. Two specific types of financial math that we use sequences to help us with are annuity and amortizations. Annuity is a sequence where you're making a same deposit on a regular basis. So it's used a lot when you're saving for something. So for example, saving for your retirement, um, you're making this same deposit on a every month basis or every year basis or whatever it is. So our initial amount deposited we call a sub 0. The reason we usually use sub 0 instead of a sub 1 as our first term is because usually you're making it like before anything happens, so you kind of think of it as time 0. So a sub 0 is your initial amount deposited, and then we define it recursively. So a sub n, the nth term, is equal to 1 plus r over capital N times a sub n minus 1 plus p, where r is your um, interest rate, Capital N is the number of times it's a year it's being compounded, just like we talked about when we were doing compound interest. A sub N minus 1 is the previous month's amount, and then P is your deposit, how much ever you're depositing. Amortizations is the same thing, except for you're paying off, so paying off a mortgage or a car loan or whatever it is. Um, similar idea, A sub 0 is B equal to B, where A sub 0 is your initial amount that you owe, whatever you took out for your loan. And then a sub n is equal to 1 plus r over 12 times a sub n minus 1 minus p. The only difference here is they're assuming that it's going to be compounded every month, so they just put the 12 in as opposed to having a, an unknown compound. r is still your interest rate, a sub n minus 1 is the amount after n minus 1 payments, and then now you're subtracting p because you're paying off a loan instead of putting money in. So one example would be a trip to Cancun during spring break will cost $450 and full payment is due 
March 2nd. To have the money, a student on September 1st deposits $100 in a savings account that pays 4% compounded monthly. On the first of each month, the student deposits $50 into the account. So we want to write a recursive sequence that explains how much money they're going to have after n months. So looking at what we talked about for annuity for the previous slide, go ahead and write a recursive formula for this. So my recursive formula is a sub 0 equals 100 because that is their initial deposit on September 1st. And then each month after that, a sub n is equal to 1 plus 0 0.04 over 12 times a sub n minus 1 plus 50. 4 came from the interest rate. It's compounded monthly, so that's why it's divided by 12, times a sub n minus 1 plus 50, which is their payment. So we want to use the table feature on our graphing calculator to list out the first six months of the annuity. So make sure your calculator is in sequence mode, so go to modes, which is a sequence. And then when you go into y equals, you'll know it. now see that it's set up for sequences. You may need to look up how to type in a recursive sequence um, because you have to define the first term, and then you also have to be able to type in that a sub n minus 1. After you do that, go to second graph, which shows you the table, and you should be able to see out the first six months of the table. So this is what your table should look like. So month zero, there was 100. Month one, there would be the $50 deposit plus the interest rate, which ended up being about 33 cents, and then every month out to month six. So this would be September 1st, October 1st, so on and so forth. So after the deposit on March 1st, is there, a month mon is there enough money to pay for the trip? So this is September, October, November, December, January, February, March. So March 1st, there's $404.53 in the account. And since they need $450, the student doesn't have enough money. So no, they will only have $404.53. So now we want to know if the student deposited $60 each month instead of $50, would they, there be enough money on the March 1st deposit? So rework the problem and see if they'll have enough money this way. So I set up my recursive formula. A sub 0 is still 100. And then A sub n is equal to 1 plus 0 0.04 over 12 times A sub n minus 1 plus 60 this time. So then I did the same thing in my graphing calculator. I changed the 50 to a 60, and I created this table. So again, September, October, blah, 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 to March. Now in March, we'll have $465.03. So yes, they will have enough money on March 1st to go to their trip to Cancun. So this has been 12.1, which is an introduction to sequences.